Welcome to uh, our panel on innovative mobile strategies and applications in the developing world. My name is Spencer Ante, and I'll be your moderator today. And um, I've been writing about technology and finance for about 15 years, and in April I joined the Wall Street Journal from Business Week, and I'm Deputy Bureau Chief of the New York Corporate Group at the Wall Street Journal, which is a new bureau they founded about seven months ago. And we cover a lot of big industries and companies like General Electric, IBM, Procter & Gamble. Um, the reason I was invited today, I suspect, is because I supervise wireless and telecom coverage at the Wall Street Journal, which is a big part of today's panel. And in fact, last night I just got back from San Francisco, where I spent the last few days attending CTIA, which for those of you who don't know, you probably, most of you do know, it's one of the wireless industry's biggest conferences. And I was really amazed at the level and pace of innovation that's breaking out in wireless today, much of which is surprisingly coming out of the US uh, as Google and Apple have become market leaders in a relatively short span of time. A lot of the innovation used to come from Asia and, uh, and Europe and wireless, and now that's, that's obviously changing. Today we're going to hear about a different kind of innovation in the developing world and looking at the intersection of mobile communications and emerging markets and the transformational possibilities that can come from that. And so I'm really excited to be here. It's a really exciting time in this, in this field. And we've got a great group of speakers, uh, including uh, several entrepreneurs. One who's raising money, actually. Maybe he'll come out of here with a, with, with a few investment offers. We'll see. <laughs> actually, they're all raising money. Surprise. Oh, so. Several entrepreneurs, uh, a development expert, and a research scientist from IBM who are going to give us their perspective from the front lines of the wireless industry in the developing world. So what we're going to do is each of them is going to introduce themselves and give a, a, a short five to seven minute presentation. And I want this to be interactive, so I encourage you to ask questions after each presenter is finished, if you would like. And also, if you're a little shy, you can feel free to uh, Send me your questions via Twitter. I'm sure you're all on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Spencer Ante, S P E N C E R A N T E. So you can tweet me your questions if you want, and I'll try to work them in. So thanks again, and David, lead us off. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's funny, as you were in, in San Francisco. You can hear me? Sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay, nice. Um, so I think half the panel was also in San Francisco last week. We were. Mike and I at least were at SOCAP, um, so it's interesting to come from the West Coast and, and now come here. Uh, I'm also a CBS grad, uh, which is, I'm always ha happy to come back home. It's a pleasure. Um, so well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Frog Tech. Um, we, we basically, we build technology, we build business tools for, for micro entrepreneurs, specifically micro retailers, small shopkeepers in, in Latin America. And, um, Basically, what we give them is a smartphone or a tablet. So we're actually wanted to go to CTIA as well, but I couldn't be in two places at once. Um, and we, we give them this, this cutting edge technology so they can, for the first time in their lives, be on top of their business and their operation and their numbers and their inventory. Uh, with, a, with a smartphone and a barcode reader, they can keep track of all the sales, all the expenses, all the purchases. They can see how, how their what the products that are the better ones are doing, how the worst ones are doing. They can basically get insights into their existing business. Uh, I don't know how many uh, here is, uh, how many of you guys are actually business school students. For those who are, probably the majority, every case study ends up with an exhibit of five pages worth of data, right? Which you don't tend to read too well, but they're there. So if, we, if you need them, you can go and read them. Uh, when you run a small business without any technology, you have no data at all. You're basically operating always, that's for, for extra drama. <laughs> You're always operating in the dark. Can, can we get it off again? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I lost my turn of thought. Uh, I went out. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so you're operating in the dark. You're basically making a lot of wrong decisions, a lot of guesstimation, which sometimes work. But when you have a thousand products in your shelves, and this is what we found, find in Colombia or Mexico, these small shops that you walk in, it's all crammed with staff. 
towards the top is basically a dash collection mechanism for the shopkeeper. So they have a lot of working capital that is totally inactive, no work, not doing anything. And in many cases, if they had to get a loan from an MFI, microfinance institution, that is costing them 60% annually. So it's, it's really a shame that they, they're operating under, this, under these conditions. We, we are trying to solve it. We're trying to help them by de devising some tool that is both very user friendly, very affordable, but at the same time very powerful. We want to bring them the, the what businesses today here in the US or in Europe or where I'm from, what, what you take as a granted accounting, you know, intelligence on my business. Um, also, because they are poor by definition, um, typically that means they're also not that well educated. They maybe have finished high school, maybe not. And they definitely not, have not been to a business school, um, at least not in, Colum in, in Colombia here. Um, so what we need to do as well, beyond giving them the tool, is giving them the, the knowledge, the education to understand what comes out of the tool, which is basically information. Um, and that means that we joke around it, but we say that we want to build a micro MBA in the phone. So they have videos, tutorials, games, quizzes. In our daydreams, when, not when we talk to investors, but in the future we want to build a simulator of a shop based on your own data that the phone knows that you have. You can play around, make bold decisions on the simulator and see how they turn out. Uh, and, and that way they can get up to speed and they can understand the flood of data that comes out of the, of the phone. Just to give you a sense of what sort of accounting these guys typically keep, they have a notebook and they say, oh, David came and he owes me 100. That's all they keep account of. Uh, so that's like a trickle of data. It's important data, it's a trickle. We're bringing them a host of data. We're saying, open your mouth, here's, here's some <laughs> real data. And they can, you know, it, it can be painful if you don't, if you don't know how to deal with it. Um, so that's FrogDeck. I'm basically, I'm hoping you guys will, will ask a lot of questions. Um, beyond Frogtex, because this is not really about Frogtex, it's about the innovation that we see on mobile phones coming to the developing world and, and taking everything by storm. Uh, I wanted to throw there the, a couple of thoughts. First, innovation in the mobile space in the rich parts of the world has really only taken off two years ago, three years ago, when, when Apple came out with the, with the iPhone. Before, it was all mostly controlled and, and captured by the mobile operators. It is great that you don't, have to, you don't have to give a certain rendezvous point and time with your friends when you go out for drinks. You can always call on your phone. But it didn't really change our lives so much because we already had fixed phones, we already had laptops. In the developing world, people had no fixed phones, had no laptops. Hey, still they don't have laptops, but now they have mobile phones. That's already changing big time. But we're really excited about bringing not only cell phones, but smartphones. So, so these guys can not only have a phone to make calls, which is tremendous already, but also have a computer in their pockets and start doing the crazy things we're doing already without any competition really from laptops. So the, the change is double there, especially when those smartphones become 3G enabled, have a broadband connection, and can do all the crazy things we're doing here. Um, so I'll leave you with that, with the drama. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike, go on. Well, he sorts it out. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name's Mike Quinn, and I'm uh, the CEO of Mobile Transactions, which is a startup uh, mobile payments business in Zambia. Um, I actually I graduated from uh, MBA program uh, the same year as David, but the Oxford MBA uh, in in the UK. Um, sorry, I think these slides might have a timer on them, so I'm gonna. Um, if, they, if they jump around, I apologize. But uh, Mobile Transactions was a business that uh, was uh, started, uh, I guess we commercially launched in April 2009. Um, and we are now, as you can see, one of the fastest growing businesses in Africa. Um, and I wanted to put this slide up out front from the beginning because uh, um, there's a lot of really, this is such a new emerging industry and it's really, really exciting. And uh, we've been uh, 
kind of had our heads in the ground for the last 18 months, myself and the two entrepreneurs that started the company, um, and really trying to get a lot of traction in this space. So this has been, it's, I was also in San Francisco at the Social Capital Markets Conference, and it's kind of a, a coming out ceremony for me to go to San Francisco and New York, both places for the first time, also looking to raise money with, uh, with Martin and the rest of the group now. Um, but very proud of this because I think we've, we've got uh, uh, over $40,000 per month in recurring transactional revenue along with some other additional revenue sources right now. Um, so I'll just go very briefly uh, the business. Um, the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve is that in Africa, as I'm sure most of the developing world, making payments is really, really hard. Um, our first client was a company called Dunavant Cotton. Um, which has a network of 100,000 small-scale farmers in Zambia. Um, they have to make cash-based payments of about $100 each to this, these farmers. So they pay up to $20 million per year over a four-month period to 100,000 farmers in rural areas down very, very bad roads. And this is the context. Um, and it's all cash. Um, when people receive payments, they, there's like a thumbprint recognition or a signature, um, a reconciliation afterwards, and it's, it's just an absolute nightmare, if you can imagine. And because 80% of people in Zambia don't have bank accounts, um, and so this is the space that we're working in. Um, we've developed a proprietary technology uh, that uh, transcends any cell phone networks, any oh, banks. It's, it's, we're a third-party business, um, but essentially enables companies like Dunavant to process payments to people um, who have cell phones via their cell phones. Apologies for the timer. Um, and uh, uh, if they don't have cell phones, um, they can collect payments through our network of agents. So if you know a little bit about the M-Pesa uh, model in Kenya, it's something that we're, uh, we, we're also building an agent network, but we're building it from scratch. Um, um, this is a, an electronic voucher product that I, I wanted to just highlight very quickly is one of the things that we're doing. Because um, what's often forgotten in this space is that 60% of people don't have cell phones. Um, so we've developed a product based on a scratch card like this, um, where our first customer is the World Food Program. They need to distribute uh, uh, subsidies to, uh, to HIV AIDS patients primarily on antiretroviral therapy. So instead of giving out food in kind, what they're now doing with our system is they give out scratch cards, and they did about 32,000 of these, um, if I can jump here, uh, in, in September this year. Um, the, the beneficiary that receives the scratch card takes this to one of our retail agents that we've set up. Um, the person, the beneficiary does not need a mobile phone, they don't need an account, they don't need a PIN card. They just take this card, which is linked to them, and then they go to one of our agents, which is like this, and the agent uh, gives them a food basket. And the agent is paid instantly um, on their, uh, electronically on their mobile transaction account. Um, so it's a cashless transaction. And as you can see, we've set up, uh, um, we've now got about 184 agents across the country in Zambia, which we've, and an agent is like a retail shop just with a phone. Um, it can be a private entrepreneur, it can be an existing chain. Um, and uh, that's, it, it provides access uh, to financial services and, and a point of sale redemption site for, for beneficiaries. Um, our transaction growth, we've, we've done about $2 million per month through our system as of, uh, I think, September this year. Um, and we're, we're now looking to use our, our agent network, um, expand on, our, on this voucher product to other applications, and really just getting involved in the, in the mobile payment space. So it's a, it's a short presentation. Let me just leave it at that. And I think uh, as we get into the conversations, uh, happy to take more questions around this. So thank you. Good morning, my name is Martin Hardigan. I'm a, also an alumnus of the business school here, but from a, a, an earlier era. <laughs> it's nice to be back, and I'm coming from a very different angle to the other speakers today. I spent my career as a development banker, and I was invited about five years ago into a very poor region of Kenya to look at how to help existing actors on the ground become sustainable in what they were doing. They have been operating off a donor-based model uh, of development, which was obviously unsustainable into the future, massively involved in every sector that served the poor. And 
with a large portfolio of things to do, but no sources of finance. I saw that there was a combination of things that could come together to really change that situation. The, uh, there's a gap that can't be bridged today. There's a massive disconnect between the very poor and the rest of the world. Uh, it goes down to the level of the mud hut and the family, and it goes all the way through the projects as well. And you would not believe how big the projects can be and yet be off the radar in the world in terms of accessing funds. The party that invited me out is the largest faith-based uh, organization in the region, and it serves some 90% of the population with water, education, health, social services of all kinds, microfinance, etc. I realized that by combining a boutique investment banking function, very lean, using local entrepreneurs, together with a combination of marketing purchasing and technology packaging, and an innovative ICT system to make everything work underneath, that the entire equation of underdevelopment could be transformed. And that development itself would take place quite differently. The innovation on the ICT side piggybacks off David's point of sale tool. It's a point of sale and point of investment system. I basically take the point of sale transactions model, add to it registration of the household, the vendor, the producer supplier, the hub entities that put the projects together for the communities, the investors and donors, all parties get registered in this model and you combine registration with transactions, add the investment component, and then sector by sector you add a few special features. Counterfeit check like Bright's that you're gonna hear about is one aspect when you come to health, but there's a host of others. You have children who are taken off the streets, they need eye, uh, an eye examination after an eye surgery some years on, and with the, the innovation that I came up with uh, to respond to that, it's possible over time to keep track of individuals who are registered in the system and can use this card for every transaction they do. Buying, selling, access, accessing income, making payments of all kinds, um, informing parties in the world who might respond to their needs in relation to projects, also accessing finance and using line item controls through the system to control how the money gets used, as in microcredits where today uh, the women typically end up over their heads in debt in the region I'm talking about because they have so many family emergencies they have to meet at any moment. The innovation is an M card, as I call it. It's a debit card. It could be the debit card for the poor of the 21st century. But it doesn't just buy. It buys, it sells, it informs. It's a gopher. It's a watchdog on their behalf. It accesses finance. It services finance. It's a card that can be used in every venue, education venue, health sector, buying water, in all of these transactional areas that today don't have a system, don't have a system of accounts or any of that. The card, in effect, changes everything about the world of development finance because it, it reduces costs massively for all suppliers in relation to investment, in relation to transactions. It re reduces the risks, all the uncertainties of information there's evidence before the fact in conducting transactions, evidence during and afterwards. There's 100% accountability on how funds were used real time through the system. The household user is completely anonymous in the system, privacy protected throughout, but the information enables anyone in the world who would respond to an orphan about to register in school or respond to uh, any situation that they decide to target through the system, they can do it and do it at the point of transaction, precisely when the individual needs to respond to their needs. That's the essence of the system, 
And I'll leave it there because there's a lot to talk about in relation to it, and it'll come up in the questions and answers. I got a lot of surprises when I went into this situation as a top-down development banker, and I have a couple of slides that uh, uh, dwell on those issues that were great surprises to me and which pointed to a totally different path forward in relation to the poor of the world who may ultimately, I believe, end up financing their own development. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. I, I, you know, we have two more panels left, but I just want to just, since no one sent me a question on Twitter, I'm going to have to ask, ask a question. Um, we've heard three different interesting perspectives from the sort of, the, from the trenches, you know, uh, uh, you know, business software for, uh, for small businesses on phones, tr uh, transaction vehicles. Um, but on a higher level, I'm just wondering, I think a lot of the reason why everyone's in this room is because we're, we're trying to figure out if these technologies can help break this vicious cycle of poverty that Africa has been stuck in for decades. And I just would love a, just a quick, quick thoughts from you guys on if do you think that's actually possible yeah. and, and, and how powerful is, is the transformation here? Anyone? I'll, I'll take a little, well, there's a famous uh, report that some economists put together on, on how the, an extra 10% of penetration of mobile phones, just because they save time by not having to go to the marketplace or, or whatever, an extra 10%, I think, increases GDP growth on a, at a country level by 0 0.6 per, I forgot the exact numbers, but it's pretty impressive that just by texting and, and calling, you can change the way the, the country's economies grow. And again, this is before you add computing. If you, if you look at the 90s, for instance, here in, in the US, the huge economic growth, the productivity growth, was mostly due to the fact that everybody got a computer. Every office worker got a computer. Uh, but that's, that's gonna happen too, you know? In five years, everybody in Africa, or at least 40%, as Mike was saying, will have a smartphone. And that, that mean they'll be much better workers. And then, so I think, yes, there's a lot of potential. comment on that too. Um, I think uh, uh, everybody, uh, the Impesa model in Kenya is, is really, really exciting what's happened there. It hasn't replicated anywhere to that degree of success anywhere else in the world, um, but the potential and the vision is clearly there. Um, going back to, I think, uh, where I said like 80% of people in Zambia don't have bank accounts. And this means for companies that want to pay farmers, um, donor organizations that need to distribute subsidies, uh, people that are actually just doing payrolls. It's, there's so much inefficiency in the economy. And uh, um, with, with payment, electronic payment mechanisms uh, that both uh, save, I think, a, an organization a uh, tremendous amount of savings and make it much easier to access a mass market or a rural consumer, provide a microfinance loan via a rural agent that before they could never access before, um, I think opens tremendous opportunities for growth. So I think where the electronic payments um, sort of industry or mobile payments industry comes in is really opening up access and then at, um, for an organization. And then at the other end, at an end user level, um, the, the farmers that, that we work with and the beneficiaries, when, if you're a farmer in Zambia and you get paid cash for your cotton crop, you have to sleep with that cash under your pillow um, uh, pr pretty much until the next season because it's, it's the majority of your income for that year. Um, so if you have an electronic means of storing it, whether it's on a smart card or a voucher or on a mobile phone, um, you don't have to, uh, to take a, a minibus 20 kilometers to the nearest town to withdraw it in an ATM machine or, or stand in a queue at a bank, um, but you can actually go to a, a small retail shop in your community to withdraw your cash or to purchase retail goods or send a money transfer on your phone to pay school fees. Um, it's a tremendous uh, and very disruptive uh, uh, r reduction in transaction costs across the whole economy. So I, I think there's a lot of potential. Brett, you want to uh, re resume the... Uh, oh, there. Uh, yes, no, oh, mine is a bit long-winded uh, and okay. complicated, so I prefer <laughs> to <laughs> manage it myself. Good morning, my name is Bright Simmons and I'm from Ghana. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for this very um, um, great honor to present uh, my vision for mobile-led um, development and innovation in Africa. About three years ago, I came up with an idea uh, that I believe illustrates quite clearly what mobile innovation represents as far as development um, in Africa and most parts of the developing world is concerned. 
So here I'll begin with the story of M-Pedigree. I think there is no doubt in this room, and I'm very sure about it, that everybody accepts the fact that medicines are a crucial component of healthcare, and that the healthcare of the planet depends as much on medicines as it depends on health professionals. And um, for those of you who remember, in 1975, half of the population of the world lacked access to medicines. More than two thirds lacked access to essential medicines, natural fact. And about three decades on, we've seen some progress. Some would say tremendous progress. It's now estimated that about one third of the, uh, of the planet's population do not have access to essential medicines. That's about two billion people. Clearly, there's been an improvement if uh, we've moved from two thirds to one third. But I'm going to explain something to you, and that is uh, uh, um, um, something that you've got to bear in mind. And sometimes development statistics obscure even more terrifying trends and undercurrents. And that is the issue of counterfeit medicines in the particular case of uh, um, uh, medicines and access to essential medicines. So what you are looking there is a gentleman holding coatem in his hand. Coatem is one of the most prescribed anti-malarials in the developing world, and it's a very respected brand. It will shock you to know that sometime last year, in the second largest city of Ghana called Kumasi, which has a population of about two million, every single dosage of that remarkably well-performing medicine was withdrawn. It was withdrawn from all the pharmacies in this country, uh, in this town, in Ghana, because they were fake. And by fake, I mean very simply that they look like the real thing, but they don't do the real stuff. You are looking at two copies of the same medicine made by a very reputable drug manufacturing company. On visual inspection, I will bet you anything that you have no chance of identifying which of these medicines can kill you. And if you live in a country like Nigeria or Ghana, this is not a hypothetical question. Because one in three medicines in these parts of the world can kill you. When I, if I go back to the picture before, the medicine on your left hand side killed 200 children two years ago in Nigeria. Somebody decided that it was too expensive to invest in formulation technology and therefore was going to use antifreeze to stabilize this cough syrup. 200 children lost their lives. And if we are to believe the WHO and others who have conducted empirical studies about this problem, then one in, ten, one in three medicines could be compromised. This is the most terrifying, the most frightening, the most systemic public health crisis the world face in proportion to the attention that it receives. And let's be under no illusion. These are the places where medicines are being made and distributed across the developing world today. This is a real counterfeit Viagra factory uncovered in the Philippines. And it is only out of respect for your sensibilities that I've not brought even more unsavory pictures of some of these factories. Some of them are local in Africa, some of them are overseas, but in all instances, the medicines that are being introduced into the supply chain have the potential to cause grave damage, particularly when they also lead to resistance. So the pathogen that causes the disease is exposed to incremental dosages of subtherapeutic active ingredients. They then develop resistance. And when these pathogens are passed on, because these are infectious diseases, it means, therefore, that medicines that could cure the diseases earlier on are no longer effective. That is why the cost of malaria, the malaria burden in Africa, has blown out of proportion. We used to cure with chloroquine, for instance. In Ghana, it cost about $30 million in those days. Now we need ACT-based medication that costs almost five times more. So the impact on the public health system is just as devastating as the impact on ordinary people. To cut a long story short, three years ago, I came up with this idea. A couple of people joined me. We relocated from Europe, some of them from the United States to Ghana. We began a process of trying to pilot a system that allows every consumer to check before they take the medicine what are three things. One that is certified for use in that territory. So in the United States, you have the FDA. In every country, there's a competent authority that does this. Number two, that is the original article as it left the factory. So it is also a security product. And number three, that um, since the time that it left the factory, nothing has happened in the supply chain to compromise it. Because one of the big problems you have is all the medicines expired in Europe and America, not all of them, but a good chunk of them, 
people change their expiry date and ship them back to Africa. So this gives you the right expiry date, the right batch number, etc. And why do we say that we now should devolve the level of responsibility to the consumer? Because in our view, and this is based on empirical research we've conducted, as well as numerous case studies, it is only the manufacturer and the consumer who share the belief that medicines cannot become simply a means of making profit regardless of the consequences. Manufacturers because they have a brand liability issue, consumers because they can die. And therefore, we do not trust the distributors and the retailers unconditionally. And this is important. So the decentralization pattern has been very effective as far as this technology is concerned. As far as business model is concerned, the consumer should not pay. They should not pay because in addition to asking them to check, we do not want to pass on the responsibility of quality certification to the consumer. We just want to empower the consumer to check. But the manufacturer should pay. The manufacturer should pay because they suffer clear and quantifiable economic costs. If you lose 20% of your market to counterfeiters, that's a huge amount of money you are, you are losing. And once the manufacturer has paid for it, we are able then to pay the telecom providers as well as um, our suppliers like Hewlett Packard, which now manages our data centers. And the effectiveness of this has been such that we've managed to convince the Nigerian government to make this a regulatory standard. We are now working with most of the leading regional manufacturers to begin the process of large-scale adoption of this technology. Six million packs of medicines are already being coded as I speak by May and Baker, which is probably the most prestigious regional manufacturer. We've seen serious and significant interest from the GSK, Pfizer's of this world. The sum, or at least the moral of this story, in my view, is one. Invention is about human ingenuity. But innovation is about social collaboration. And until the development industry begins to accept the fact that cross-sector collaborations have come to stay, and that private sector institutions or agencies and the rest of it, and government sector institutions and the rest of it, should now begin to work together through innovative models that are financially sustainable and the rest of it, we are not going to see much progress. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Bray. That was a really uh, stunning story about the power of innovation. And before we go to our last panelist, I just, I just want to ask one other question, because your story raises a much bigger issue, which is the issue of corruption and fraud in Africa, which there have been numerous stories and reports and studies about the issue of corruption. It's a global issue, but it's particularly uh, present in Africa. So I just want to, I'm just curious, have you encountered any examples of corruption and fraud in your, in your experiences in, besides Bright, in, down, in, down in these different countries? And is that still an impediment to um, development in Africa? Or is the mobile phone uh, somehow disrupting that cycle of corruption and fraud? <laughs> any, anyone, feel free to. Jason, you can even answer that if you want. Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Does this work? Yeah. There we go. Uh, corruption and fraud, let's see. Um, we in, in IBM have, you know, my perspective is really being a, a fairly new, uh, compared to the panel, uh, visitor to the African continent. Our work has started about two years ago. And so although we've seen vestiges and challenges along the road of uh, it sort of the, we, we've seen through in back alleys and things, the I, images and, and the idea that there may be fraud along the line somewhere there, we haven't actually seen it manifest in a, in a very real way, in, in a way that might affect our business most directly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Spencer, so the, the thing with corruption is that it undermines both good laws and bad laws. So where you have a situation where, for instance, you have complex bureaucratic um, regulations and the rest of it, and if somebody was going to bribe their way to get through, it may be morally questionable, but we've seen instances where it actually improves the efficiency of markets. On the other hand, you have situations where there are clearly good laws, for instance, public accountability and transparency, where corruption effectively undermines those institutions. So it is a, a double-edged sword. My issue in most parts of Africa has been more with the competence of the basic institutions. So if you went to the land registration authority and they gave you title, could you trust it? Mm -hmm. That may not be fraud, that may not be corruption, but it's simply lack of competence. Mm -hmm. And I think when you compare Asia and Africa, 
on a lot of the indices, particularly the Transparency International one, you find out that it is not actually the case that Africa particularly suffers from, from corruption or fraud. However, the problem is that the institutions are just so weak that fraud and corruption may tend to weaken them further. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think you find challenges of, of fraud particularly if there's a, um, an inefficiency or a lack of information flow. Um, so before we rolled out our electronic voucher, um, uh, our key, our big clients, which are the World Food Program and, and the Food and Agriculture Organization right now, had a paper voucher where they would give a piece of paper to a beneficiary that would then take it to a local shop, um, redeem it for a bag of seed or a bag of food. That piece of paper would have to go back um, to a central office, be audited, be reconciled, and the retailer would get paid five or six weeks later. Um, and there's that time lag there where what they found was um, if uh, there would be collusion at the retailer level, there would be price inflation, um, and introducing an electronic voucher where through our system, the retailer, uh, the, an individual shows up to a shop with one of these vouchers, the retailer is paid instantly, and our system verifies to make sure that that actual beneficiary is entitled to, to the subsidy that's being delivered. Um, what we've found is it's, it's reduced... Uh, um, all, any cases of kind of price inflation by the retailer dramatically and at the same time um, whereas under the paper voucher system our, our clients used to give 20 pieces of paper that would all be redeemed but they actually didn't know whether the actual intended recipient was the one who was getting the subsidy. Um, so they found that w now they have uh, quite a significant problem because where they, they might have had 20 beneficiaries since they're all electronically registered in our system and they can track them on a real-time basis, they're finding that maybe only 10 to 15 of those were actually real beneficiaries. Um, so it's, it's, it's been very disruptive in, in um, primarily just bringing informational flows on a real-time basis. Great. Let's, let's hear from Jason. Okay. okay, I'm back here. So uh, I'm Jason Ellis, and I work at the IBM Research Center up in Westchester. Um, where I'm in the social computing group and I lead the developing nations work that we're doing there. As I just mentioned, uh, this work is just about two years old, so it's very interesting to hear from the panelists who've had spent more time in Africa and, and other regions than I have. But uh, we have had significant experience during that time. Uh, my main area of interest is technology for underserved populations. And for my PhD thesis, I actually built an online community that supports kids interviewing elders to build up a shared database of oral history. And uh, I actually deployed and studied this system in inner city class classrooms. Um, my degree is in computer science, but this is really an interdisciplinary project uh, that combined field work, design, implementation, deployment, and evaluation. And um, on graduation, I joined the social computing group at IBM, which is fittingly an interdisciplinary group uh, that has psychologists, computer scientists, and designers, among others. And the way we basically work is we go into the field, do field work, look at how technology is already working, look at how people are currently doing their work and the challenges they face. And then we start to build prototypes. So paper prototypes initially, we socialize those, we get feedback. And then we start to build more richly defined prototypes. We build, bring technology to bear, and we start to roll that out on a broader basis and ultimately build a product. And then we do qualitative and quantitative analysis of our work along the way. So it's a very iterative process and one that involves multiple disciplines. And it turns out that IBM is also very interested in another uh, underserved population, and that is those in developing nations. And we really see it as a, a growth engine for the company. And that's why we re refer to these regions as growth markets. Uh, in Africa, we have offices in Kenya, South Africa, uh, Nigeria, and we just opened one in Ghana this year. We, uh, and we have a long-term research presence in India, and we just opened a lab in Brazil as well. And so we really have a broad basis for uh, doing international work and, and exploring technology for underserved populations. One of, one of the really nice things about IBM is that we have a worldwide presence, and so we have access to a variety of markets. So what I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview of some of the projects that my group has done in developing nations and, um, and get your feedback. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, so the first one is Spoken Web. This is uh, basically an, a project led out of our India lab that we've contributed significantly to and I actually spent some time in India working on this. It's an end user content creation system using voice. And basically what this means is that it's a question and answer system. There's many uses for this type of technology but the, the most prevalent one has been question and answer and it's been deployed most specifically to farmers in an area called Gujarat. Um, 
Farmers ask questions via voice and get answers from other farmers, and they also can get feedback from a local farming NGO that has expertise on things like irrigation, choosing the appropriate seeds, can give them feedback on weather and things like that. Um, this project has been deployed about two years ago and has had over 500 participants in the area of Gujarat, and they're looking to expand around India and actually around the world, and we're facilitating that in Africa, uh, and this work is ongoing. Uh, we've also worked with a variety of NGOs, and one in particular is called Text to Change. And what they do is something called incentive-based SMS quizzes. The idea is, and this is an education project, they're trying to help people better understand, particularly AIDS and the challenges that go along with that around health. Uh, the way that this works is that they select a population and they send out questions to that population. And so a question could be, you can get AIDS from a mosquito bite, yes or no. Uh, responses come back. If a response is correct, they give accolades and more information on the topic. If the response is incorrect, they give the right answer and more information on the topic. And every week, all those who have the, ha have the most correct answers are entered into a pool for free cell phone minutes. And so this is the incentive part of the project and really a way that they motivate people to participate. They also give away uh, soccer jerseys and mobile phones. So. This is um, what we've been doing there with text to change is really studying the use of SMS as a vehicle for this type of project. Uh, and SMS generally as a user interface. You know, typically people are used to using SMS to interact with other humans. So are there challenges interacting with a computer system instead? And we've also been using, uh, been, been working with them to help make their system more scalable and sustainable using what we're calling social incentives. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, We've also been doing some work in the US, and the work that we do in the US we refer to as, as analog populations. Basically, you know, sometimes it's challenging for us to travel to these far-flung places, so a finding a population in the US where we can build some early technology and explore its use in, in, a, in a local area uh, provides some benefit to us. And we know, you know the folks in the US are not the same as, you know, in this case, we're working with homeless populations. The homeless in the US are not the same as those at the base of the pyramid in developing regions. But to the extent that there are similarities, we can take some learnings forward and do some early prototyping and then move to an actual field deployment in a developing country and learn even more. And so what we've been doing with the homeless is building a, um, a system that helps them better communicate with each other and also with their caseworkers. Um, the homeless that we've been working with have basic cell phones, and so in that way, similar to many in developing nations. Uh, their caseworkers, we built for them a web-based user interface. And this interface uh, allows them to send and schedule outbound SMSs, so things about job offerings, meetings that they could go to, other things that they could participate in that would be a benefit to them. And provides an inbox as well um, for uh, incoming SMS messages from their clients and also voice messages coming in. And so what we've got is a huge, a complete audit trail for the interaction between the caseworker and, homeless, and the homeless that they're sponsoring. And this provides great benefit in terms of a collective memory for the organization. So instead of a caseworker leaving on, at the end of the day and taking all the voicemails and SMS messages with their, their, the folks they're responsible for with them out the door, instead this is a repository that can be shared among caseworkers and handed off between them. Uh, in the shelter, we built a electronic message board we call the Big Board, and there we can, the caseworkers can post announcements. In addition, clients can post messages in either voice and, or text. Uh, they can text in messages to a particular short code. Uh, they can also post, call in and leave a voice message and, that's message, and that's translated to text and posted on the board. In addition, there are postings from georgiahousingsearch.org uh, that allow, the, you know, the site lists housing opportunities for these folks that are quite relevant to them. And one of the nice features of this system is that folks can walk up to it and uh, next to each item on the board there's a little number, they can type that number into their phone and that pulls down more information about that particular item to their phone. So for example, if I want to go explore a few housing opportunities, I can yank stuff that's on the board into my phone and then go out to the field and explore those. Uh, and this project has been deployed in, on, on an ongoing basis in Atlanta with a partner at Georgia Tech. So our most recent work is actually, and still uh, developing work, has been with a couple universities in Nigeria. There we're developing applications that uh, combine voice, text, and images to address the needs of low literacy farmers. And the idea there is to allow them to take photos in particular of artifacts they'd like to discuss 
So plants, animals, and buildings, other things that they have challenges with, things they'd like to discuss. Again, with a, 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 a mind towards a facilitating low literacy, folks who have low literacy, and then allowing them, using these as an anchor for voice conversation. So allowing them to talk about these things, share them with one another, and, and push the discussion forward. Uh, so in this way, kind of a multimodal type of interaction that we're exploring there. So um, just to kind of finish here, I'd like to just point out three things that have really are central to the work that we're doing. First off, mobile phones. Um, you know, mobile, is the, mobile phones are the connected device of choice in these regions. As many on the panel have, have mentioned, you know, laptops and, and, and standard computers are not nearly as prevalent, and so we're really focusing there, uh, and particularly on low-end mobile phones, because things like SMS uh, can access any phone that there is out there. Uh, and, we, and, mobile, and the low-end mobile phones are the most prevalent ones in these markets. Um, but secondly, cloud computing. You know, because even smartphones have limited compute capability, uh, we really need a, a back-end engine that can allow for richer, more scalable applications. And all the applications that I've talked about uh, here are actually deployed in, in the IBM cloud. And we've developed some unique capabilities to allow phone calls to come into the system and go out, and we can, it's, we've got a bridge that allows us to deploy applications from this cloud all over the world. Um, and lastly, and, and probably most close to my heart, you know, we're use, interested in using social interaction to help individuals leverage each other to mutual benefit, to work together, and uh, to help build on existing social networks and create new ones that really empower people to help one another and, and so, you know, to the, the, the question before, really uh, thinking about using social interaction as a mode to help people lift themselves out of poverty. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. Um, we got about five or 10 minutes, so I wanted to open up the floor to questions. We do have one Twitter question, which I'm gonna give that person props for. It's RAR624 says, Good question. Uh, what role do you see mobile operators uh, for mobile, mobile operators to help in these efforts? We haven't really even addressed that. Is, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I know Safaricom has been very active in promoting a lot of these services. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that, that we've seen is that uh, if you're doing work that has a social benefit, the telcos are actually quite interested in working on those. I think partially because their image in communities is, is not necessarily the greatest. They're seen as sort of uh, sometimes profiteering at the expense of, of the everyday person. And so if they can do things like uh, work with an NGO that's exploring health by giving them free cell phone minutes to do their projects or free voice minutes to a, another project that maybe is using voice for farmers, that's something that they're, they're really interested in from a corporate social responsibility angle. The other motivation for protests is the sheer pressure on the margins in their main categories of revenue, which is voice. Um, because of the increasing proliferation of uh, um, telecom companies in the same country, there's massive pressure on, 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 on voice revenues right now. And average revenue per user is dropping drastically. So they need to promote data services and other application-based services yeah. as a means to, to, to um, counteract that trend. Um, you know, if you're IBM, you don't have a problem getting money to do these things. <laughs> you should, you'd, but, be, you'd be surprised, especially, yeah. especially in research. Yeah, that's true. But you have a $6 billion research budget, so that's not too <laughs> Indeed. bad. Indeed. But you know, in the US, obviously, the availability, availability of capital it, it has always been a, a strength of the US, the financial institutions, the venture capitalists, the angel investors, who in a lot of ways are getting the, helping to get these things off the ground in conjunction with the entrepreneurs. And I'm just wondering, um, what, what is the availability of capital in Africa or other developing nations for these kinds of projects? Is that another stumbling block or challenge? They all nod their heads, yes. Um, but how do, you, how do you get around that? Or what are you doing to, um, to remedy that? Or do you see, are you networking more? Are there other investment groups that are coming in? I know there are, you know, private equity investors are looking at Brazil and some of the more well-known developing markets, but for these more, you know, frontier markets, what's going on there? I'll, I'll tell you guys this, a little bit this uh, story of, of how we got started at Mobile Transactions. Um, the base lending rate in Zambia is 27%, and if you want to get a home mortgage, it's prime plus five. Um, so, and that's if you can get a loan. So the banks are completely out of the question. There's no angel investors. There's not really any venture capital in Zambia. Um, what I did, I actually, uh, 
uh, graduated from undergrad and then lived in, in Ghana for a year and then Zambia for a year and a half and then did my MBA after that. And I wanted to get back into uh, uh, to the business and entrepreneurship and development kind of intersection. Um, so I managed to convince uh, a fund called the Grassroots Business Fund, which is based in DC, um, to buy me a plane ticket. And I said, I'm gonna move to Zambia and find you investment opportunities. Um, and <clears throat> just by pure coincidence and sheer good luck and timing, um, discovered mobile transactions, which was pre, pre-revenue, pre-transaction, but there was two really great entrepreneurs that had built this technology over a f- like several years beforehand, just in the early stages, as all entrepreneurial ventures um, come about. Um, and then I was able to facilitate a, a startup investment of about $200,000 from the Grassroots Business Fund, um, which in hindsight was a huge leap of faith on their, their, uh, their behalf because it was very early stage. We didn't have our model figured out yet. We actually didn't really know what, it was, what we were doing. But it bought us, uh, it bought us enough time um, to kind of get some traction on the ground. Uh, we were very, uh, 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 I guess, aggressive going after grant funding, um, which there is quite a lot of. Um, but it's sometimes hard to source as a private sector startup because everybody wants to fund NGOs. Um, but we did get some grant funding from a, a UK CSR grant from a clothing company and from a German donor um, to get us kind of at the next level. And it's really, if you want to get investment, it's about traction, traction, traction. And it's, uh, you know, throw away the business plan um, and just kind of get on the ground, make something happen and prove, get, let the numbers do the, the, spe- uh, the talking for you. Um, so we, we eventually kind of figured it out, sourced some people, got a team together, and now we're at a level where we actually just had our first EBITDA positive quarter, um, uh, which our quarter ended September 30th. So. Um, it's, it's a lot easier talking to investors to say, this is what we've done as opposed to this is what we're going to do. Um, sure. So the next step, we'll, we'll see how hard it is, but I hope it's easier. Sure. Great. Uh, we have a question right here, and then we'll go down to in the front. I'm from the University of New Hampshire, where we are in early stages of, of starting a center for social enterprise. When I think of social enterprises, um, in as as many of the panelists have described, there is both a, a financial um, impact measures and social impact measures. I imagine you're all uh, measuring uh, almost incidental improvements in, in livelihood. Uh, development, but I'm wondering if at the core of your 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 mission and your business model and how you speak with potential funders, you've art- articulated the social measures as well. And if so, what what are those? For us, it's fairly easy to measure impact because our our devices are accounting tools, so they're measuring all the time. At the same time, I can tell you that uh, we have four angel investors. They've never asked for social impact metrics yet. I think it's quite a bit to ask when you're trying to get the business up and running. On top of all the millions of things you need to do, start measuring social impact, which we know the professionals who only do that have a hard time with. Uh, we, will lo- we, w- we want to report. We want to help push the edge in that sense, but maybe in a couple of years uh, when we have actually you know, grown the network uh, when we have a bunch of, um, of, of shopkeepers working with our technology. Uh, for us, it will be actually fairly easy because we will have the data. Uh, it, it mes- I mean, there's many millions of social impact you have just by walking around the street, right? But w- with our, our phones, basically, we we'll, should improve both the education level and the profit level, the income for, for this low income population. So that's, that's our social impact right there. And we, will, we should be able to see very easily on our, on our servers. Um, but I, I was just in SOCAP, uh, as I said before, and there was this, oh, there were a bunch of announcements about rating systems and, and uh, metric measurement frameworks and, and everything. And I think it's, it's great when you're the big boy, especially if you're the investor, to say, okay, I want to have social metrics, but help us out. If you, if you want to write a check for that, <laughs> I'll, I'll measure anything you want. I'll come up with a budget and, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if I can pick up on that, um, I, I agree with the idea that it's, it's just too hard to get deep into that early on. And even ultimately, I spent a career uh, uh, attempting to do those kinds of things across the world in all kinds of project situations. Extremely difficult. Um, 
in doing what I'm doing, I'm very conscious of this problem, that whenever you have interventions, either to support, to subsidize a particular transaction of the poor, or whether you are having an intervention that is going to move a project forward that is going to significantly change everyone's lives, you don't have, over time, a way to capture the data of what the heck's going on in those people's lives. I therefore have come up with a model where I have the household registered, all the members of the household registered. I'm able to track over time because of the transaction data coming in real time. You're able to track over time how a person moves in their life in terms of educational attainment, how their health profile is changing. So if someone has intervened on their behalf, they're able to see that. They're able to see that they got a job. If they've supported an orphan who's about to get registered to school, they can later see that that kid is moving on and they can continue to intervene to support from wherever they are in the world. Likewise with investors, because they suddenly are in a totally different position of having actual information and 100% accountability on the use of money. So without going there, they can act and actually see real life parameters of progress in a person's life or a whole community's life and in a project's performance. So that's a whole change of the ball game. It totally changes the trade aid, investment, emergency relief and development equations. Uh, and then you've got the data and you can start doing your sophisticated analysis. Let's have a few more questions. Hi, I'm Andrea Pizzaconi. I'm the principal of the Christie Company, uh, and we invest in education infrastructure in Africa and other developing markets as manager of Africa Integras, which is a private equity vehicle. I wanted to pick up on your question, because I would hate for anyone to think that there isn't an enormous amount of investment interest in Africa. Um, actually, there are billions of dollars being lined up in private equity funds and hedge funds. Um, but perhaps what some of you could talk about is what are the barriers to closing on that funding. I mean, obviously, we raised venture capital. Um, we have lots of commitments for project financing and whatnot. But that missing middle of investment, which is that, that middle phase that is required to close tr large transactions and whatnot, but also um, in order to close with these larger investors, the exit strategies that you all have lined up and what your investment horizon is. And Martin, in particular, I mean, to, to meet someone who is instrumental in implementing MEGA and what that did alone for the world in terms of bringing frontier markets to a point that uh, institutional capital could go into them. would love to hear your perspective as well as others. What I think uh, is possible now with these technologies, if they actually work, if the Android pad is going to send a reliable signal and we can connect it to internet, you unlock the entire internet space and you can begin to have a, a, a complete breakthrough in, with respect to those barriers where you've got no one on the ground who's putting the data on the table about projects You've got no one who can, over time, uh, control the use of monies, and you don't have accountability on what's going on. If you're a donor or an investor, and you're trying to reach the poor, the real poor, in their communities for their projects, which they all have their projects, and they're great at executing them, they need to own them, execute them, operate them, and conceive what they want to do in the first place. I have had to innovate by coming up with what I call a community incentive bond, which has an income kicker, an incentive based on accretion in income of a community. You may not be able to attach to a revenue line on the specific project if you're in a water scheme or something, right? So how do you get your teeth into that if you're in a, uh, an equity fund or someone who wants to participate in the development process? You can't, you can't, you, today, you can't get in there. The equity is the wrong model, I'm convinced. I think a bond that's patient capital that is able to participate in the upside, and I've discussed this with the communities, they're delighted to share the upside in, in their performance as a result of projects of all kinds, even if it's sanitation, water, sanitation, you name it. It's going to impact the community's uh, value of output on its bananas, its mangoes, and everything else. And 
if you are also able to connect them to players who are going to represent them more effectively on purchasing and on selling so that they're getting a better piece of the true value of their products, you've got then, because you're attaching to it through the system that I've designed, you're actually able to have 100% assurance that you have access to the funds to service the bond. So you're in a totally different equation and one which also actually quietly, because of the algorithm in the bond, actually has an automatic m savings mobilization function at work where the farmer doing better in a particular year is actually carrying the weaker one. But getting now the bond yield itself on that and becomes a very exciting uh, uh, investment opportunity for a regular household. I don't know if I've answered your question. But that's kind of, that's the exit, because the bond is really the exit. You're still yeah. going to need financing to get to the bond, and I agree with you that the bond market, the more you develop it in Africa, the more that the, the random retail investor or the small-scale investor can come in. But, but, but as you talk about the exit, maybe if some of the others could talk about, I mean, it, that you still need that middle investment to be able to get to that exciting exit. But I agree with you that that's the exit. We might not fix, solve that one right now, but we, we have time for one more question, and then I'm sorry, the gentleman, you can come up after, because we're already running over. Hi, uh, I'm a Columbia Business School student. So my question was, there is always problem in finding early adopters for any technologies. So for so, some of you who are coming up with like new technologies in this particular region, what kind of reception are you getting in these regions? And what strategies are you applying to get early adopters? Thanks. I'll take that one, um, if you don't guys don't mind. Um, that is true, it's the early adopters is really, is, is, is the key to get started, basically. Um, what we have seen is that they, they have such a hunger, such a thirst for technology that some, in some cases they've bought our system because of the phone or because of the accounting. Which kind of sucks because the user you, <laughs> they doesn't use their software, uh, but there there is, and that was we're definitely not trying to manipulate, but it's true that there is, that the mobile phone in this community is, is more of a status symbol than here, where here everybody already has an iPhone, so what can you flash? There's nothing, um, so you can you can take you can take advantage of those those trends already to help you find those early early adopters. Um, and just ride the wave, you know, they, they see it coming. And Mohammed Yunus said a while ago that the mobile phone for millions of people is the passport to the future. They see it coming. It's the first time, uh, pretty much the first time they have the same type of technology as we have here in the richer parts of the world. So there, there is, there, many of them are leaning forward. Also, these communities, we're working in Mexico and Colombia, they're young, they're young countries. There's a lot of young people have no trouble understanding the smartphone. They actually love to get their hands on it. Um, so we, we're not really having that much of a trouble. Well, thank you for all coming, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it.